we're live. Bethany, thank you so much for some time. How are you? Doing well. How about you? Yeah, I'm great. I'm great, thank you. I'm I'm thrilled to have you on the show. And and the reason why is that I'm absolutely fascinated with the Enron story. I don't know if I should say Enron scandal. I know it's from referred to in lots of different ways, but the uh, Enron, the smartest guys in the room, has been one of my favourite books for a while. And of course, I've watched the film, and I'm just absolutely fascinated. And for me, it's just been a, a you know, I've probably picked it up a number of years ago, but for you, it's probably been something that's you know, it's been many decades of work for yourself. Um, I'd love to know you know where it all started. Like, where did you first hear about Enron, and you know what what were those early understandings of what was going on? Well, it is. It's it's interesting that people stay, that people remain interested in the story almost two decades after the bankruptcy, and I find that fascinating. It's not often that you have a business story that sort of leaps off the page, the business pages and captures people's imaginations. And for a lot of reasons, Enron Enron did. And I think it's at least because in the U.S. it was the first big bankruptcy of a major American company in a really long time. Mm. And the idea that you could have this company that was so celebrated that could just seemingly go poof overnight was was a moment, I think. And not just a moment in business history, but a societal moment for, for America, because I think we didn't think such things were possible. And we have, as you know, a somewhat laissez-faire system and people had all their retirement money invested in Enron stock. And all of a sudden they thought they had a lot and they had nothing. And it, it just it just vanished. And I think that's that's a shock that I'm not entirely sure we've, we've gotten over yet. But I, I first heard of Enron probably in the 1990s. I was working as a reporter at Fortune magazine, uh, which was part of Time Inc. at the time. And Enron was just this incredibly celebrated company that was supposedly reforming, um, revolutionizing, reforming is to make a word, revolutionizing um, gas and electricity in, in the United States and around the world. They were building power plants in all sorts of uh, interesting places from South America to India. And Jeff Skilling, who was in the chief operating officer, had this grand plan to trade natural gas like he traded oil and eventually to trade electricity and to trade weather. And he had this grand idea to make this this whole this whole trading system. And it just seemed like Enron was everything that was new and good and revolutionary. And this was at the time of the, the, the first dot-com bubble. And all of that seemed of a piece. Mm. So it's so fascinating. I, I think for, for context, I'll share some numbers and correct me if I'm wrong, because I'm still learning the story. But uh, I believe I believe Enron at the time had 29,000 employees. So it's a significant, it's a large, large organization. And, I, and I'm still not quite sure on the right numbers where it, I'm talking 60 billion in assets. And I've also heard there were apparently 101 billion turnover or revenue. Um, I suppose that's going to come back to how, how the accounting. Um, and I mean, that's just a significant number. And then for them to go bankrupt in what seemed to be 24 days. Yeah, it's yeah, just it's, this huge it just went off a cliff one day just like the film stated and then you have to look back to the previous 10 15 years of trading to understand kind of what actually happened yeah yeah it was it was interesting because there was a lot of skepticism about and it was very much under the surface so it was smart people who worked at hedge funds often oddly enough who had had who had somebody working at their hedge fund who had, who had come in contact with Enron in a different form of life. So one group of hedge funds that were short Enron had people who had worked at McKinsey, the consulting firm, and McKinsey was a big, Enron was a big client of McKinsey's. And people who had, young people who had worked at McKinsey on the Enron account and then left and gone to hedge funds were like, this company was so screwed up because they'd seen what was actually happening on, on the inside. And then there were other hedge funds that just dug into Enron's numbers and said, wait, you can't tell how this thing is making money. What's, what's going on here? There are all these weird Things in the financial statements that no one wants to look twice at. In many ways, Enron was a fraud in plain, in plain sight. Um, um, although fraud is too loose a word, and we can we can I mean, a specific word, and we can we can come back to that. But um, but but it, but it was interesting. So there was this skepticism um, brewing under the surface since at least the mid to late 1990s. Um, but the stock just kept going up 30% a year, 50% a year, 80% a year. And so people, it, it, it seemed like the stock price, as it so often does, and as I hear people say today, that the stock price, the stock price was proof that the company was real because the stock wouldn't be going up like that if there were anything wrong. And of course, you know, Enron's exhibit A, that the stock can go up and go up crazily for a long, long time and there can be a lot that's wrong. Mm. So, so in your, so am I right saying you were at Fortune 500, the magazine, when, when, yeah. when you first, so you the, that magazine, it's Fortune? Fortune, yeah. Oh, okay, Fortune. Fortune. All right, it's so Fortune magazine. So, you, so you, you were there, and am I right in probably saying that you, you were seeing or the film kind of shared that you were one of the first analysts to, to just kind of just ask a few really basic questions of Enron, and or maybe one of the first people just to ask even a subjective question in some respect, which was. 
you know, how does Enron make its money? Yeah, well, it's, it's worth clearing up. I'm, I'm not an analyst, so I'm a, I'm a journalist and have been a journalist for, for, for a long time. Okay. So so I, I wasn't an analyst. Fortune was a, um, is still a magazine. So just like a magazine in the UK that prints stories by journalists. It's not, um, it's not an, and it's not a, it's not a Wall Street publication. Okay. I mean, it's not. So, so I, I wasn't an analyst. Um, yeah. So it was, it was, it was pretty basic in the sense that a lot of, um, what a lot of, nobody could explain how I made the money. And so that's what I mean by saying in some ways it was a fraud in plain sight because if you were willing to just look at their financial statements and say, wait, how is this working? Um, people would quickly say, well, I don't really know. So it, it was a case um, then and it happens now all the time where people are just so happy about the bottom line results that they didn't really care about how the proverbial sausage was being made. They just wanted the company to continue to spit out the bottom line results. And that was that. So, so what was it that made you ask that question in, in your article? And I appreciate you've you probably done some research, looked at financial statements, kind of where, where did you get to your conclusions of maybe maybe things aren't quite quite right? So a source of mine who was a hedge fund guy who was short the stock had called me and said, how does Enron make this money? Can you, can you think, can, nobody knows the answer to this. And I thought, really, nobody knows the answer to this. And I made a lot of phone calls and looked through the financial statements myself. And there were lots of strange things in the financial statements that made you say, oh, this doesn't look right or this, this doesn't make sense. And then I found that when I talked to the company's biggest supporters, they actually couldn't answer that question of how and how made its money. One um, even laughed when I asked the question and said, well, if you figure it out, let me know. And then he went on to say, well, you don't have to worry about it because these are the smartest guys in the room. And they, 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 I don't have to ask the basic questions that I might have to with another company because I just know their results are going to be spectacular and these guys are always going to make it work because they're, 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 they're so smart. So it became, I wouldn't say obvious, but there was plenty of corroboration that the big believers in the stock didn't really understand how it was working. And there were lots of strange things in the financial statements that, that raised red flags about how profitable the company really was and about how its business actually operated. So, so, so I ran a story with what in retrospect was an incredibly neat headline is that not overpriced. Um, given that the country company was bankrupt six months later, yes, it was overpriced. <laughs> um, 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 and it wasn't really, I, it's one of those rare times in life where you get too much credit for something because I didn't break the story. And people, people say that after the fact. But to me, breaking the story is really getting underneath the surface and explaining what actually is going on inside the company. And I didn't do that. My story was not because I had an internal whistleblower who was saying, here's what's going on inside this place. My story was purely from the outside in saying, hey, here's this really celebrated company and nobody, nobody gets it. So, so, so it was a, it was a, um, it was a sort of the right question to ask, but it wasn't the answer. And so to me, breaking the story would be having the answer and not just asking the right question. I understand. I'm with you. So, so let's go back to kind of what actually happened, because I think that is something, again, it's in, it's in your book and it's in the film and it's just fascinating kind of how it all escalated in some respects. Because so, in some respects, I'm still don't, I'm not convinced they all set out to be, they didn't set out for it to be a scandal. I think they all wanted to run a well-run company, a well, very well profitable company and innovative company. I don't think they set out for it to be this way. So I wonder if, if it was greed or if it was just confusion or I don't know. But I mean, cash is king, right? <laughs> you need to get money in at some stage. So let, let's go back to, to, to the kind of the beginning of obviously 1985 is when Kenneth Lay started the organized, started, started the business. Obviously, it was a merger of, of two companies. And it wasn't until... I think up until that point, pretty much everything normal cost accounting, as it were, would have been would have been in the business. So therefore, up to those points, everything seemed it would have been pretty much okay. I would have thought. Not, 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 not really. Although I want okay. to come back to the end of the I think the merger, I don't remember anymore. It was so long ago, but I think the merger that created and which was the merger of two pipeline companies. I think it was. Yes, that's and correct. And yeah. It was sometime in the, in, in, in the 1980s. Oh, and there sorry, was a, sorry, I meant 1985. Yeah, apologies. I'm not, so there, was, there was an episode then in the late 1980s that's in our book called Valhalla, which was this oil trading scandal where it became very clear that Ken Lay was willing to look past any kind of bad behavior um, in order to find things that would make a profit. But he cared more about what the results were than about how those results were achieved. And if achieving those results meant cheating and lying and stealing, he was okay with that. And so that became um, the canary in the coal mine in our book in the sense that this is a culture that was problematic 
from, from day one. Mm. But there was a man there who, who is still a big American energy executive, might retire now, named Rich Kinder, who was the company's chief operating officer. And he, like many businessmen in America, maybe elsewhere, was willing to push the envelope for sure on accounting rules. But he, he knew when to stop. He knew what the line was. And so at least our point of view in the book was that Rich Kinder kept the company under control. And once he left, and I'm struggling to remember exactly what year that was, and Jeff Skilling became the chief operating officer, then kind of all, all bets were off. But you're, you're absolutely right. And it's one of the reasons that I think makes the story so fascinating, although the same thing is true more, more often than not, which is that these were not people who set out to bankrupt the company. They didn't have this diabolical plan that they'd hatched in some dark smoky bar where they were going to, you know, run the company into the ground and steal money for themselves while doing it. They were people who really believed and wanted to see this, this thing succeed. What they couldn't do was admit it wasn't succeeding. And so instead of saying, oh, this business isn't working as it was supposed to, they found ways to make the numbers look like the business was working. And I don't think they did so out of greed, greed per se, but I, I think greed per se is actually overused as an explanation for, for, for what goes wrong. And what I mean by greed per se, I mean, I want $5 million so I can go buy a private island or a, you know, or expensive sports car. I don't think it's that, but I think in our business world, um, greed is, um, greed is a, um, a, um, a symptom of, of ego. And, and ego is this guy over here has a hundred million dollars. I'm as good as he is. I better have a hundred one million dollars. It's a kind of well-known phenomenon that you're only as rich as the person you're comparing yourself to. And I think at least the American business world, I'm not familiar enough with, with other places, if I suspect the same thing's true because it's human nature, is you're only rich if you're rich in comparison. To, to to somebody else, uh, and so it's not it's not greed for greed's sake. It's greed for the sake for the sake of ego, and I think that for sure was a component of, of of what happened too. But but if if they had just been willing to let the new businesses they were trying to start show results in their own time and allow failures to take place and tell Wall Street honestly, yeah, this didn't work the way the way we thought. Um, Enron could still be around today. So the, the, the whole problem was that they, Jeff Skilling wanted it to be a spectacular stock market success. And to do that, you had to produce earnings and you had to produce really consistent earnings growth. You couldn't go to Wall Street and say, oh, this didn't work. And and I think this is a broader comment on the state of business, which is still true today, because you, you want executives to be able to go to Wall Street or go to their investors and say, for Rightly. Yeah, this didn't, this didn't make sense. We tried for this big thing. It's not working on schedule. But there's so much pressure for, for in, in, in the market and so much pressure from investors to continue to produce earnings and not to miss earnings numbers. And if you're a CEO who repeatedly misses earnings numbers, you're probably going to get fired. You don't get a lot of dispensation or a lot of forgiveness for numbers that aren't, aren't working on schedule. And so that's what happened more, more than anything was a desire to make, to make things look better than they were. And not to admit failure, um, but it wasn't with the intent of bankrupting the company. Okay. Interesting. So I think it was 1990 that uh, it's Jeffrey Skilling that joined the organization. I, my understanding is he, he joined and he became the CEO of the finance division. Now, am I right in saying that he, a part of his package of joining, it was that he had to bring in the accounting practice, mark to market accounting. Was that a part of that or is that, no, I've not got that right. <laughs> Don't have that right. He he joined from McKinsey from the consulting firm, hmm. and he came with this grand plan to build a natural gas trading operation. Um, so before that, you know, we trade oil. Oil is a global commodity that can be traded all over the world. Natural gas, it's much more complicated to ship, so you still can't trade it internationally. But his argument was, you should be able to trade natural gas domestically the way the way we traded oil. You should be able to trade contracts for natural gas, and that by doing so, you could create something called the gas bank where buyers and sellers could get exactly what pieces of the natural gas product that, 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 that they wanted. So that was the innovation that he that he brought to Enron. Um, as part of that, once he was there, he argued for a concept known as mark to market accounting. And what that means basically is that your accounts reflect the value of the contracts. What it's supposed to mean <laughs> is that your accounts reflect the value of the contracts on your on, on, on your books on a on a on a on a on an ongoing basis. So you don't book a contract that says this person agreed to pay me a hundred dollars over the course of, you know, a hundred days and since natural gas is at 10 now and I'm selling it to them for a hundred, therefore I've made $90 and this is going to sit, that, that, that would be what's known as cost accounting. This is going to sit on my books at 90, at $90. 
what what mark to market accounting says theoretically is I, they've agreed to pay me a hundred dollars natural gas was at 10 we struck struck this deal oh dear natural gas is at 200 now i'm losing a hundred dollars so at its best mark to market accounting can be more honest than cost accounting because it takes into account where prices actually are and says oh the value of this contract that we struck isn't a static thing it changes based on where prices are and we're going to reflect that in, in, in our accounts and so what it speaks to to me is that there's there's no perfect there's no perfect system of accounting. People think of accounting as a science and as a set of and and as as absolute truth, and it's not. It's a it's it's an art, and it involves estimation and some guesswork and some some assumptions. And mark to market accounting can be every bit as good, if not better, than cost accounting. It all depends on the honesty with which you approach it. But mark to market then also allows you the especially if you have things for which there isn't a readily observable price. So you're dealing in complicated contracts where you can't just go to the New York Stock Exchange and say, what's the price of IBM? Instead, you, nobody knows what the price really is. It allows you a lot of um, latitude in how you book your results because you can take that same contract and say, well, nobody really knows. And natural gas isn't a great example for a short dated contract because people would know what the price was. But if that contract was, say, over 20 years, you could say, nobody really knows what the price of natural gas is going to be in 20 years. So you could say it's going to be 50, you could say it's going to be two, you could say it's going to be 200. And so this quarter, if we need a little extra earnings, we're just going to make the price of natural gas more in 20 years more favorable to us. So it can become a way to cheat. But the cost accounting can be a way to cheat too. Everything can be a way to cheat if you want to cheat. That's interesting, that actually. Sense? Yeah, it did, it did, it did. I mean, ultimately, these are incredibly com complicated, com financial complex um, instruments. And, that, and, that, and, that, and that's the thing is to try to get your head around when, when I was watching the film, it kind of made me feel like they met in the film, it almost glorified, I wouldn't say glorified, but it made a really big story around the mark to market accounting and said, this is the hypothetical value that we're putting on contracts. And it's the future value. You book a contract for 10 years and it's, um, you know, it's a hundred million or whatever it is. And then we were recognizing all of that upfront straight away. And I don't know whether that's just a slim, simpler, simplified version of that, but of course, Anything, if you're going to recognize it all up front, is, is clearly going to be a challenge in, in that instance, you know, whereas cost accounting, you can recognize that over the, over the lifetime of that contract based on the P&L, which just kind of make, makes a lot of sense. Right. So I, I think um, in some ways that they, they did in the film certainly talk about that a lot, um, but it almost like in the film kind of made it feel like that was the thing. But actually, it, it was probably a combination of a whole bunch of different things and people and approaches and, you know, those types of things. What, what were the other things that were kind of kind of happening at the time that kind of that, that made it all happen? So for sure. And I, I think I want to pause on that notion of um, recognizing value up front because Jeff Skilling actually had a philosophical underpinning for that, which was that if you have an idea, then you should recognize the entire value of that idea right away. Because otherwise, all you're doing is clipping coupons from the idea over the life of the idea. And that that, in his view, um, which was sort of a rationalization, I think, but that that's cheating, that kept clipping coupons over the life of the idea is, is sort of intellectual dishonesty. If you have an idea, everything about that idea should be valued at once so that you're forced to come up with another idea the next day. And I remember saying once, well, does that mean that if you came up with the idea for the car, that GM should have booked, you know, General Motors in America should have booked the future value of every car it was ever going to sell over right away because that was that was the, the core idea. So you can take that to, 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 to the absurd. You can also see how there's something there, though. So that's I think that's one of the reasons Enron remains so interesting is that there are these sort of philosophical questions at, 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 at at, at the heart of it. But for sure, it wasn't just mark to market accounting. It was, there were lots of ways in which lots of complicated financial ways that Enron came up with to high debt, to manufacture earnings, to misrepresent its, 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 its results. Um, mark to market accounting was just one among, among many, but I think the film makes a big deal of that because it, there's this great video of Jeff Skilling when he when he that's sort of a, 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 a that that's sort of a skit that that they did at Enron to celebrate March to market earnings. But Alex Gibney, who made the film, he was the first one who said this to me, which I, I think people people know. But he said, you know, humor is is often it, it appears like a joke, but there's usually an element of underlying truth in it. So that skit, while it was humorous and it was how Enron could commit fraud with March to market accounting, it actually turned out to have this this really interesting element of truth to it. So so, but but it wasn't for, for sure. I don't even know in the scheme of things how if, if you would if it had just been March to market accounting alone, if you would have had a scandal. I don't I don't think so. Just on that skit, because it was a it is a hilarious part of of the film. But of course, when the film is written and created in such a way, and it's looking at hindsight, it can then poke fun. How I don't even understand how Jeffrey Skilling 
would have been in a situation where he's even making that video, like as a joke on himself. Like, I don't know if that was internal video, if that was for Saturday Night Live, like. Internal video, and it was just meant to be a, a, a joke. Like, corporate, you know, corporate cultures have, except there was an element of truth to it, which I always think is is, is interesting. It's so often the case with jokes, right? People use humor to camouflage some darkness, to hide, to reveal yet hide. And so sometimes humor, humor is unintentionally revealing. Unbelievable. So, so from from your perspective, then, so all, all those different things happened, and then it was around sort of the two two thousands into, into the early two thousands when, um, of course, you started re- reporting. You kind of wrote those bits, and as you mentioned, it was just six months later. Then actually, they, they filed for bankruptcy. This season was six months. My story came out in February, so March, April, May, June, July, August. It was actually more like nine months. Okay. <laughs> I spoke loosely when I said six months. Yeah. I mean, that must have just sent shockwaves across America at that time when these big organizations. And then, of course, following that, then I'd imagine that's that's when there was the lawsuit to find out exactly what had happened. And that's kind of where, where the film's at, at as well. And your, your name's mentioned as well in there in, in a little bit um, within in, in the film, I think. Um, with um, having those conversations with Jeffrey Skilling, do you, do, and do you have? I mean, how, what's your recollection of of that conversation that you have with him? Um, I'm not sure which conversation you. you oh, I, th- you, I, th- I thought in the film it referred to apologies. If I got right, it wrong, it was, so, it, was, it was so long. It was so long ago that oh, I, the, I I think I filmed that back in 2003, 2004. Oh, so. Sorry. And I haven't, I haven't rewatched it, so I'm, I'm sorry. Um, no, it's okay. It's okay. I think, um, so, so what happened was in the film, and obviously this is newer for me because I've recently watched it. So, so um, Skilling mentioned something that to 2001. So there was, um, you asked that question, and then apparently, um, there was a point, maybe it was a, an interview or something. That Andy Fasco came to see you the next couple of days or so, and then you went through some of the accounting. And I think, I think Jeffrey Skilling had. You had some sort of conversation, maybe it was a conference call or something like that. Um, yeah, and- it was a conference call. And so ah. as, a, as a journalist, when you write a negative story about somebody, or in any case, you're supposed to call and give the book opportunity for comment before you publish. You oh, okay, publish. interesting. And so before the story, as I was working on my story, I called in and said, well, you know, here's some questions I have for you. Do you want to comment on them? And much to my surprise, um, Jeff Skilling did and wanted to talk about it. He was quite aggressive. He, he said, you know, essentially people who raise these questions are just throwing rocks at us and you are unethical for raising these questions because you don't understand enough about our business to, to be writing a story on us. If you understood our business, you wouldn't be raising such stupid questions. And, you know, the fact that they're so stupid is proof that you don't understand what you're talking about. And so he was just, it was just great. It was just a very aggressive conversation. I mean, the interesting thing about that, and I think about this a lot is that you could have been great. I mean, as a journalist, no matter how much homework you've done, you could always be missing the main point. Like you could have just you you can you try to talk to as many people as you can so you're not missing the point, but you could just be too thick for it to be set sinking in, or you could have just not talked to the right person yet who could help you sort of open your mind and see things the the, 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 the right way. So that is always possible, no matter how much homework you're, you've done, that you are raising a stupid question. And so that's why I think it's so frightening to be accused of that or so undermining to be accused of that because it could be true. It's not, you know, it's not the kind of criticism that you can say, oh, well, that's bullshit. You, there, there's a part of you that has to say, hmm, you have to reckon with that. Mm, interesting. So he was aggressive on the phone. I mean, he could have been nice as pie. He just could have been nice to you and just giving you some really basic answers. And then you, you would have, might, might have been quite comfortable. But because he was so aggressive, did that raise the alarm even further for you to think there's, there's something here? It, it didn't at the time. Okay. And in retrospect, it seems obvious that it should have, but I was just scared. I, mean, I was I was young, and suddenly this big company that I was writing about, which had seemed like uh, not really a game to me, but it had seemed like an intellectual exercise. In other words, mm-hmm. here is this company that nobody can make sense of the numbers. Wow, how interesting! And I didn't, I wasn't researching it, thinking this is a big deal, and this company is going to be bankrupt and become one of the corporate scandals of no, the decade. Of you know, I I, w- I just thought, oh, there are these interesting disconnects here. What a, what a fascinating story this this will make, and you know, maybe somebody can explain it. And so I wasn't had I had I ever thought that the story would kind of achieve the magnitude that it that it did, I would have been ter- utterly terrified. <laughs> but so when when I, I sort of expected when I called Enron that they would be quite polite and would be like, yeah, people raise these questions, here are the answers. It's you know, it's really stupid. People just don't get this. And so I was just shocked by the anger and by the by the reaction, and all of a sudden. 
you know, there's those moments when you're working on something when all of a sudden the dial gets turned up and the stakes are suddenly so much higher. I was you know, 29 or 30 at the time, a young, you know, a young, not very senior reporter at Fortune. And so all of a sudden I have this big company that's really mad at me. And so my thought wasn't, oh, this means I'm right. They're angry. My thought was, oh my God, I must be really screwing up. You know, there, there's a, and in, in from, from this vantage point, looking back at it, of course, I would say, I would say more likely that you're onto something when people respond that way, but it was hard for me to see it that way. Moment. I can certainly understand you being afraid. I mean, someone as senior as, as Jeffrey Skilling saying those weird things to you. But then I, I understand that he, then then um, Andy Fascal, who was the, the CFO at the time, um, came and then sat you down and went went through the books with with yourself and a, and a colleague. I mean, that that must have been quite a frightening and eye opening day. Yeah. So he didn't really go through the books, but he oh, promised okay. that. He and a couple other executives would come up to Fortune and make sense of, of, of things. So no, if he had opened the books and gone through them, then there wouldn't have been a story there, right? Then, then it would have all gone away. Um, and it wasn't me with a colleague, really. It was me with a couple of my editors who had been researching Enron that they sat in on the meeting um, um, because you know, Fortune was going to publish this story. And so it made sense to have editors in a meeting to make sure it wasn't just a journalist going rogue, essentially. Um, but it, but in essence, they didn't, they didn't, the Enron executives didn't really answer any questions and so that was the that was the had they opened the books and said as you just said mm. and opened the books and said oh here look, this is how this works and this is how that works then there wouldn't there wouldn't have been any there wouldn't have been a story right so, so yeah so, so that day was just a some dialogue and i mean what, what did 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 it make any even any sense why andy was then sent to have a conversation with you really i think i think the idea was that if you um send executives up to a publication and you're dealing with a fairly young reporter, you might just shock and awe. You, it's sort of the corporate world version of shock and awe. Editors might say, oh my God, this company is mad. They're serious. Um, um, look at look at what's happening here. Let's just back off this story. Why do we need to do it? So I think that's part of the, that's part of the, the, the strategy. And there, and there is often, you know, in, in the media, there is often an, oh, I've gotten access. I've gotten to talk to people. Now I'm going to be nicer. One, and some, sometimes it works. And sometimes it works for the right reason because the, 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 the reporter was wrong. But sometimes it works for a bad reason, which is people just get intimidated. Hmm. Brilliant. Okay. So then after, so two, it was, let me just check. I'm trying to check the dates and everything that happened. I believe your book came out in 2003. What was yeah. the process of you going through that book? Because the book is incredibly detailed. And I often think about God, how how were you able to sort of research and gather so much information? And of course, you you were you were working um, on on that with a with a co or co author as well. But the book is so detailed, and you're and you're referencing conversations that were so long ago. How how do you even go around collecting all that information to to turn it into into the book? Yeah, so I worked on the book with another reporter at Fortune, a guy named Peter Elkind, and we did it together. And um, we were lucky in some ways because Enron was such a scandal. There was a mammoth excavation of everything Enron related. So Congress did a did huge investigation. Then there were tons and tons of lawsuits um, filed by private plaintiffs. And so there were there were just enormous amounts of documents uh, that were that were available. And then the Enron, the bankruptcy examiner did an enormous amount of work to figure out what went wrong here, what were what were what were all the accounting tricks Enron used in order to make itself look more profitable than it than it was. Um, the Justice Department in the US ended up um, indicting a number of executives bringing criminal charges and indictments themselves are really rich sources of, of, of information because they'll often contain internal emails and other things that um, criminal investigators are able to get their hands on and journalists aren't because criminal investigators have subpoena power and they can go to a company and they turn everything over. And so there was just there was just a wealth of, of information. And then because the company had gone bankrupt, it was it was over. And so it, that that means it's it's a little easier to find people who would work there who, who would talk to you than it is. I, I, I'm sure the UK is similar, but in the US, it's it's quite hard with when a company is an ongoing operation to find employees who are willing to talk to you or former employees. Not always. Sometimes it works, but um, but it's a challenge because employees aren't supposed to talk. Right. And there's quite a lot of. Um, 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 consequences for them if they if they talk to the press without being authorized to speak to the press. So that it's it's a difficult process if the company is still an ongoing operation. If it's gone bankrupt, then it's easier to find former employees who are willing to talk and willing 
to say, here's what happened in this meeting, here's what happened there. And so then you just do what journalists do and you take all that information and try to make sense of it. But um, but it was, Enron was one of the most, I think, if not the most heavily investigative company in, in history. And so there, the, the document um, the document trove was, was a rich one. Mm-hmm. It just seems like you must have been through what reams and reams of documents to try and piece it all together because it's an incredibly detailed book. And of course, the film is detailed as well. But it's, I mean, the audio book is 20 hours. So, um, sure. yeah, it's about that. Yeah. I, I haven't listened to it. So, yeah, <laughs> it, was, it, was, it, it, it was incredibly detailed. Yeah, there's just so much in there. When you look back now and you think about everything that happened and your role kind of just in, in, in writing about it, do you, I mean, do you think this will ever happen again? I mean, I, I hope it never happens again for a lot of people. But when you look back and you you sort of think about everything that happened, like how do you how do you feel about it all now? Oh, I think it obviously has happened again. I mean, it's happened on a grander scale and on a smaller scale and all around the world. I mean, the financial crisis, the global financial crisis, um, was in many ways not dissimilar to Enron, um, um, but it for sure was malfeasance on a broad scale with huge um, economic economic costs. Um, for another more recent example, Theranos, um, the blood testing company in the United States, was Enron-esque in, in, in many ways. Okay. Um, Wirecard, Wirecard, your own scandal over in Europe, um, um, was was you know something that people thought was a fraud for seven or eight years, and we're calling out, and it finally collapsed with a whatever it is two billion dollar cash hole at its, its its center. No, I think it continues to happen. I think that's part of probably what makes the Enron story so relevant is that is that it has all these echoes. Um, yeah. Well, just, just to finish off on some of the key characters of, of kind of what happened next. So so in my research, I think I've got, so Jeffrey Skilling, of course, went then to, he, was, he went to prison for, I'm going to say 10 plus years, something like that. Um, yeah, I, I don't remember the exact number. I think it was 10, 11, 12, something like that. Yeah, that's right. 10, 11, 12 years. So I know he went to prison, but I have seen also some, something saying that, in July 2020, he's now out of prison, so he's been released, and and he's setting up a new organization. Yeah, yeah, as he as he should. I mean, of course. Part, of our, part of our system is that we, we serve this time, and you could argue, relative to executives, for instance, who were involved in the financial crisis, none of whom were prosecuted, that he actually served a pretty heavy sentence. Um, perhaps if you if you argue in absolute terms rather than in relative terms, you could say for what he did, he deserved that that sentence. But if you look at it in relative terms and you look at the number of executives who have been involved in similarly, if not more damaging things and have just been able to walk away, then you could say he paid a really heavy, heavy price. And so I have nothing against him trying to start a business. I hope he's successful. Yeah, absolutely. And um, so Ken, Ken Lay, of course, who was the founder of the organization, he, he, um, he, he went, of course, through the, um, through the court system and, and he, he, it looked like he was going to go to go go to prison for a, a similar period of time, but I think he, he ended up having a heart attack, um, yeah. in and and passed away before that actually actually took place. So um so he, so he's um, he's no longer with us. And then there's Andy Andy Fastow, and of course the CFO. So he did go to prison, and I believe he's still in prison. If I'm right in saying that, no, no, he, he has been released. I think Andy got out before Jeff did. Oh, hang on. Has- you're right. You're right. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. So he, so he, I'll just check my notes again. So yeah, so he came, he came out of prison earlier. Yeah. He only served six or seven years and he's now actually on the speaking circuit and he gives speeches about what went wrong at Enron and why, how to see signs of the same kind of behavior in other companies. And they're actually quite good. He's, he's, he's a very smart man. Yeah. I mean, so, I think, I think they're all, they're all incredibly smart to be, even to be, to, to have led organizations like that. Bethany, thank you so much for your time. It's been a real pleasure in talking to you. It's just been really I've, I've really enjoyed the book. I've really enjoyed the film and it's been a real pleasure in, in talking to you today. So, so thank you so much. I, I really appreciate it. Thank you for having me on. Have a great evening. Oh, and you. <laughs> thank you so much, Bethany. You take care. Bye.